Lord God, we thank you because you are amazing. You simply are. You're so much greater than what we can even conceive and even what we think or imagine. Your power is great. Your imagination is great. Your love is great. Your grace is great. And Lord, I thank you for this time of year when people get a little bit more spiritual. They get a little bit more open to spiritual things. Father, first and foremost, that we would be as open, just wide open, ready to receive with open arms, open hands, open hearts, anything that you have for us. We want to hear from you. We want to receive from you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you'd be speaking tonight, not that it's me speaking, Lord, but that's you speaking through your word and even through one another, Lord, and in sharing and, and praying for one another afterwards. God, we just, we want to be with you. We want to be in your presence. So we invite you here, Lord. We invite you here. We continue to lift up Pastor Dave and, and pray for your healing in his life. We pray that it be complete and total healing of his lungs and the, the different areas that are affected. Father, that you give him strength, that he would rise up with wings like eagles. Lord, also we pray for um, some of the prayer requests that were just shared. We thank you for incredible praise reports of, of healing that take place. Brain tumors healed in Jesus' name. Father, we recognize that you are the healer. The doctors got, aren't able to take any credit for this. It's all you. Lord, we thank you for opportunities to share the gospel and people's lives getting changed and transformed because that's what you do. You change and transform lives. We also thank you for opportunities to speak your truth and to study your word and, and this Bible study that James has with the firefighters. Lord, that you would open their hearts and Lord, that it just wouldn't be a couple guys, but that it'd be a bunch of guys that would be hungry for your word and that they'd be iron sharpening iron. There'd be people getting saved and there'd be people getting set free. Because, Lord, we know that that's your heart's desire. So, Father, this time now, it's yours. Speak, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a couple weeks ago, we looked at passive parenting, the pitfalls of passive parenting, as Jacob is this model of doing things right and doing things wrong, and doing things wrong and doing things a little bit right and doing things wrong again. He kind of does it all wrong, and occasionally he gets it right. But we get to watch him, and, and the Bible's great. I, I heard somebody say, um, experience is the best teacher, and see if you can learn from somebody else's experience. Uh, because you don't want to have to go through a lot of those trials, a lot of those testings. Well, this, the book here, the Bible, Genesis, has so much about Jacob's testings. And what we've, we looked at, of course, the fact that he, um, he stole the birthright from his from his uh, brother, he flees up to Padam Aram, gets a wife, doesn't realize that he gets two in the bargain, which then become four, which becomes some problems. He, gets, he finally feels the Lord calling him to leave Padam Aram. He's got 11 sons, one daughter, four wives, but God's telling him to go. He leaves, and as he leaves, he sends word ahead to Esau, and he's hoping that he can make peace with Esau. And he gets word back from a, a sentry that says, Esau's coming with 400 men. And Jacob's shaking in his shoes. And at that time of testing, at that time of trial, at the time of desperation, he meets a man at night and ends up wrestling with him till morning. Later finds out that that man is the Lord. He wrestles with the Lord. And of course, his hip is thrown out of socket, but he's recognizing that his dependency is on the Lord and that the Lord was going to provide for him. He parts ways. He sees Esau. They, they embrace. They hug. They kiss. They go their separate ways. Jacob then says, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to buy a house because that's what I think I need to do. Of course, God had told him that he was going to live in a tent and be a sojourner. He was going to be a pilgrim all his life. And yet he decides, but I want a house. He buys the house, and he's outside the promised land. He's outside the promises of God, and he realizes that that's not where I'm supposed to be. So he sells the house. He picks up his tent, and he moves to Shechem. In Shechem, he's deciding, you know, this is a, this is a nice little town, and it's a pagan city. And he's got a daughter. And this one daughter says, hey, can I go out and hang out with the girls? Yeah, 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 no big deal. And he's not watching over her he's not being a covering for her he's not taking care of her and he just lets her go and she goes to hang out with the girls but in the process she's seen by Shechem kind of the prince of the town and Shechem is smitten with Dinah and eventually lies with her rapes her and wants to have her as a wife Jacob meanwhile because of his passive parenting doesn't know what to do doesn't know what to say doesn't really in fact just doesn't say anything the sons find out without him even telling them and they're upset. 
all 11 of these sons step in and say, no, 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 this, this should not be. How could you do this? And, and they try to calm down and say, well, we, we want to marry her, so let us marry. And, and the guy's learning after their dad. Remember what Jacob means? Deceiver, heel grabber, heel catcher, tripper upper. That's what he was. And they learned from their dad. And so what they said, hey, okay, the only way, they make the negotiations. The son make the negotiations for the father because the father's kind of, yeah. I don't know what to do. And maybe you've been there where, you know, you've got your kids and they're doing something, you just don't know what to do. Well, somebody does. And usually that somebody is not following the Lord. And so what happens is somebody steps up and it's the kids that step up and say, well, you know what? We can marry with you if you get circumcised. Now, I don't know if they really had the whole plan from the beginning, get them circumcised and then we'll wipe them out. They may have just thinking, you know what? The only way it's gonna happen is if like pigs, you know, pigs fly. It's like you get circumcised. That's what they were thinking, okay? The same kind of connection because for a grown man to go through circumcision was very painful and it was a huge sacrifice. And uh, they say, yeah, we're willing to do this. And of course, they, if you remember the story, Shechem sells it like all their land, all the land of these Israelites will become ours. They'll mar- intermarry and we'll gain all their wealth. And so he sells it to them. They, go get, they all get circumcised. And when they're in their weakest point, Simeon and Levi, the two brothers of Dinah, go and wipe them out. Jacob's response, Jacob's response to all that is not, you sinful guys, you're unrighteous. He doesn't say that to his sons. He says, look at the death you brought upon me. Passive parenting focuses on me, focuses me on as a parent. And and the result is I've got my eyes so fixed on me and what's happening with me and how it's going to affect me and how I'm going to look and what's going to happen to me and and how my kids are going to make me look. The result is I can't see what's best for my kids. I can't see what's best, what's the right thing to do. And I don't know if you've been there. I find myself there with having gone through teenagers and now having a a five and a seven-year-old. There are times where I'm getting frustrated and I realize I'm getting frustrated just, it's not because I'm frustrated at them. I'm frustrated that they're not doing what I want them to do. It's a control issue. So I have to look at myself and say, what's going on here? And there's times when they're just, when they're fighting with each other and I just want, oh, I don't want to deal with this. Passive parenting says, hopefully there's not too many bruises, and you walk away. But that doesn't solve it, it does it. It continues to fight, it continues to fester. Well, in the midst of this trial, in the midst of this, look at verse 30, uh, chapter 34. Jacob says to Simeon, verse 30, Genesis 34, verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites, the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. Remember, Jacob was just told that he's been given the promises, that he is going to be prolific, that God's going to use him. And here he is in the midst of it because of their debacle, because of what happened, because of his passive parenting, he's focused on, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm really going to die. And you're going to, kill, and you're going to get us all killed. That's what his focus was. He'd forgotten the promises of God. And of course, Simeon and Levi say, should he treat our sister like a harlot? You didn't take care of it, Dad. We took care of it. Problem solved. Ouch. And in the midst of that, in the midst of despair, in the midst of trial, in the midst of desperation, God speaks. Chapter 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Now, got to remember, back up. When he had fled from Esau, he, he was running because basically mom kicked him out and said, mom didn't kick him out, but mom said, get out of here. Your brother's so upset. I, I'm afraid you're going to die. So he leaves to go uh, supposedly find a wife. He's basically, he has nothing and so he has a stone as his pillow, and as he's sitting there uh, going to sleep one night, he sees this, uh, Jacob's ladder, the whole thing, the angel's coming down, and he names that place, he names it Bethel, and he says, this is the place, this is the house of God. And so here he is in desperation now, some 20 plus years later, and God says, go to Bethel. Go back to that place. Go back to the place you heard me speak. Go back and Listen. God has a way of repeating himself. And sometimes when we've wandered off the path and we, we kind of find ourselves out of the will of God and you don't know what to do, it's like Ephesians, or, sorry, um, 
Revelation 2, the, the church at Ephesus, when they had kind of wandered away from the love of the Lord, what did, what did Jesus tell them? He said to repent, remember, and repeat. Re- repent, turn around from what you're doing, remember from where you've fallen, remember what happened in the past, and then repeat those things. And that's what he's saying here to Jacob. He says, go back to Bethel, go back to the house of God, and I'm going to speak to you there. Go back. And of course, Bethel, that's what it means, the house of God. Verse two, and Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been given, has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which is by Shechem. Okay, he says, he says, you know what? We're going back to the house of God, but before we do that, we need to get right with God. So you need to put away your idols. Put away those idols. You all have them. That's what he said. He knew his kids. Remember, when they left from Laban, Rachel took the household idols. There was kind of a claim that the idols were actually even a, a, a connection to the, the household wealth of, his father, of her father Laban. And so there's this connection even with idols with wealth, um, of course with idolatry. But he says, put away, put away the foreign gods, purify yourselves, change your garments, let us go to the, the house of the Lord. Let us go to Bethel. Okay, so... Here's what he does is power parenting is really saying, you know what? We need to get back with the Lord. We need to get right with the Lord. We need to get rid of our idols. The challenge for most people is they don't know when they have idols. How do you know if you have an idol? How do you know? Let me throw that out. Anybody? Okay. Time, a measure of your time is an indicator of idolatry, okay? Okay, if it, if it consumes a lot of your time. What else? Okay, if it's taking away time from the Lord, you won't give it up. If it's hard to give up. Uh, the, what's that? Okay, if it has more value, okay. Focus. Okay, if I'm like, you know, if I'm, if I'm always, for example, um, if you invest in the stock market or you invest in gold, you're probably going to be spending a lot of time focused on what's happened to the market, what's happened to the market, what's happened to the market. All right? That's where my focus is. What else? Attention, time, and money. Mm-hmm. That's good. Let me write that down. ATM, attention, time, and money. Um, it's what I think of it. I think what it consumes your time. It consumes what you talk about. You know, whatever you talk about is probably important to you. And if you don't talk about it, it's probably not important to you. So if you talk about the Lord, it's probably that the Lord's important to you. But if you don't talk about the Lord, then the Lord's maybe not as important as you say it is. He is. So we, where we spend our time, what we talk about, where our treasure is, where's your treasure? There your heart will also be. So where's my focus? Um, I, there is a, there's a thing that is a huge idol in most people's house. Okay. <laughs> my, not my iPhone. Um, okay, but children can be an idol. You're right. Children can be an idol. Your, your spouse can be an idol. Yes. I was thinking something that was a little bit more flat, rectangular. Yeah, it, it's in it, HD. Yeah. Here, I, w- I was doing some research on this. And um, do you know, it used to be like last year, two years ago, the average person in the United States spent four hours a day watching TV. Okay? Last year. Today, it's five hours. Five hours a day. That means seven days a week, five hours a day. That's 35 hours a week of TV. That's a, you know, I guess basically a full-time job. I got a full-time job. <laughs> Do you know that I, I, was, I was reading a report. Um, they, 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 
they had a little recorder, tape recorder in a person's house to, to measure, to record what were the most common phrases in the house. You know the two most common phrases in most American houses? <laughs> What's on and move over. Okay? What's on TV and move over. I'm going to sit down with you. We got the TVs on all the time. There was a, it was a study, and it was saying, and it's interesting, um, it, it, everybody's watching TV, um, and apparently the older you get, the more you watch, okay? Um, I, seniors at 65 and over, the generally speaking, they're watching seven to eight hours a day. That's a lot of TV. Um, and uh, now that's just, this, from the research that I was reading, that, that is just the TV time. That's not including an hour plus for internet for most people. That's not including this time, you know, which also can be an idol because we bow down to it. <laughs> right? We, we, all these things are, they can be idols. Having a TV doesn't mean that you're in sin. Doesn't mean that it's an idol. Having a phone or a smartphone uh, or any of those things doesn't mean that you're in sin. But what place does it have in your life? If you were to throw it, some of you are concerned there because, but it's just a thing that I'm hoping is okay. <laughs> I got a good case. But, that's, but the point is, what happens when one of those things is pulled out of our hands? How do you feel? When one of those things is dropped, when one of your kids is playing with Wii Remote and they go to bowl and there goes the TV, what happens? What, if it, it shows you what place it has based on the anger or what's going on in your heart. When those kids don't do what you want them to do, you've got an idol in control. <laughs> we, we, we have lots of idols. We don't realize it. And that's the problem. Here, Jacob says, we're going to put away our idols. And so they all did. They put away. They had idols in their hands. The challenge for us is knowing, when is it an idol? When does it become an idol? You have to look at your time. You have to look at your treasure. You have to look about what you're talking about. Are you talking about it all the time? It's probably something that's consuming you. And then you have to, and you pray about it. And you let the Lord lead you in that. He says, purify yourselves. So we've got the, the, to, the laying away of the idols. That's the exterior. The purifying of the self is like what's on the inside. I'm going to purify myself in the sense of I've got to put away what's going on inside my head. I'm purifying myself in terms of what I'm thinking about. Notice he said, put away the idols, purify yourself, and change your garments. That's what the priest had to do before he went in to see the Lord. This is what Jacob is recognizing. We, before we're going to go see the Lord, we need to get right. Now, the challenge is a lot of people, before they come back to church, they think that they've got to get their act together and they've got to do all this stuff. No, to come to, to the house of the Lord, you come, you come humbly, bam, that's it, that's it. That's all you have to do. But the result is, if your heart is really changed, you are going to leave those idols down. You are going to put them away. You're going to purify yourself and say, God, I want to get right with you. God, cleanse me. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Purify ourselves. Now, then he also says, change your clothes. Now, why the clothes? Because they're in a culture. They were in a pagan culture. Remember we talked about it a couple weeks ago. When, she, when Jacob said, hey, Dinah, you can, yeah, you can go out and play with the girls. Hang out with the girls. The culture has got so much paganism that we don't even realize it in terms of what's acceptable. And, 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 we, and we kind of, yeah, it's no big deal. And so the, the clothes become stains. The clothes become a symbol of the world, the symbol of who we're, you know. For example, you all, you know, to, I'm looking out here and you all look like you're dressed pretty normal. Now, if we were to go to Africa, most people wouldn't be dressed like this in, in, in the bush country. If we were to go to Nepal, okay, did they dress like this? If we were to go to, um, you know, some other country, they're not going to dress like this. We're dressed, honestly, like our culture, you know? Now, is that a good thing, a bad thing, an ugly thing? It depends. What part of our culture are you going to want to identify with? You know, when, when kids get caught up in gangs, what's the first thing they do? They got the colors, you gotta have the, gotta be right, wearing the right colors, the right signs, the right symbols. What signs and symbols are we wearing? What signs, what's on the exterior? What's exterior? What image are we projecting with our car, with our bumper stickers? Sometimes we live in a Christian bubble. I understand that. And I have a bunch of Christian shirts, but I use those as an opportunity because I, you know, sometimes, I, I'm, whether it's a Christian t-shirt or it's a Christian um, dress shirt, 
And, and somebody reads it and like, huh, what's that about? That gives me an opportunity. But looking for those opportunities to be salt and light. So purify your hearts, change those clothes, change your garments. Genesis 35, three. Then let us arise and go to Bethel and I will make there an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and, distress and has been with me in the way which I've gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which is by Shechem. So they did. They gave the foreign gods away. They gave the, um, the earrings which were in their ears. Interesting. Earrings being associated with paganism. Now, jewelry often is uh, symbolized or connected with some different types of paganism, but there's also a sense of, what am I giving ear to? What am I listening to? Music-wise, TV-wise, YouTube-wise, what am I listening to? What am I giving my ear to? Who am I listening to? And saying, you know what? I want to throw off anything that's not of the Lord. I'm going to throw off anything so I don't want to hear from the enemy. I don't want to hear from the pagan culture. Lord, I want to hear from you. And having our ears turned to him. That's where we, that's where we need to come back to, hearing. Lord, hearing, speak to us, Lord. But often, Lord is speaking. It's just we've got so much else that's drowned out that I can't hear. I can't hear clearly. So they gave what was in the ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. He hid them under the terebinth tree, or oak tree in some translations. Oaks were a little bit rare, and so they were, they were symbolic of, of, uh, of a, a spiritual place. Okay, But the tree is also symbolic. The tree is a symbol of the cross. So what they did is they took their pagan stuff and they buried it at the foot of the tree, the foot of the cross. They said, you know what? We're going to leave this behind. They didn't take their pagan Metallica, DC Talk, I'm not DC Talk, ACDC, all these things, a little bit different there, whoo. And they didn't take their pagan stuff and say, you know what? Let's, Let's sell it on eBay because we can use that money and then we'll give that money to the Lord. No, they said, we're going to bury it. We're going to put it in the ground so that it rots, so that nobody else is going to be tempted by it. It's like, it reminds us of the book of Acts, where they, they basically took all their sorcery books and they burned them, the cost of which was in the millions of dollars for that day. Because they're like, you know, we're not going to sell them. We're not going to let somebody else profit from them. We're not going to, we're not going to let somebody else be stumbled by it. We're going to take this pagan stuff and bury it, get rid of it, burn it. Verse 5. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Okay, so he names the place the house of God, or it's the house of God is what Bethel means, but now it's God's house of God, or the God of Bethel. He's naming it. He's he's putting it right. He's like, okay, we're headed there. And notice, as he goes and he's walking in faith, he was afraid that they were going to attack him. But instead of being attacked, the other nations are afraid of him. And sometimes as Christians, we're so afraid of what other people are thinking and not realizing that most people either aren't paying attention to us at all, or they're freaked out enough about what's going on in their own life that we just walk right by them. We just walk right by without being really upsetting the apple cart. And that's what's going on here. They walk right by, they go through the land of Canaan and they come to Bethel. And then he na- renames it. He says, this is the Lord's place. Now verse eight. Now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. Um, Deborah was, it was basically Jacob's nanny, okay? And she raised him. And so this is one of his first deaths that he's experiencing. And he's pretty shook up by it. He's not quite sure um, what to do with it. And in Allah and Bakuth, that's like the, the place of weeping. And so there was, there's a lot of turmoil here. And that's part of what God takes us down. Sometimes, first of all, there was the death of the gods, of their, 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 false, of their false idols, the things that they were laying down. Those had to die. Then the next thing is that there were some people in his life that were going to die. And that God wanted to say, I don't want your hope to be in nanny. I want your hope to be in me. I want your hope to be in me. And so 
nanny goes, goes away to be with the Lord, hopefully. And um, Jacob, it goes through weeping and mourning is part, that's just natural part of going through that and that death and, and that experiencing that pain. But God shows up once again in the midst of his pain. Verse nine, then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padam Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, and to your descendants after you, I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with them, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. Okay, basically, God, once again, in the midst of his sorrow, God appears, and God wants to speak to you. Maybe you're going through a dark time. And, and, and Jacob taught on it uh, last week on, on Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're there, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You're there. God leads us because he's with us. And so God is with him here. God is speaking to him here and says, your name was Jacob, heel grabber, tripper upper, but now your name is gonna be Israel. He had already been given that name Israel, but the problem is that he kept going back to his old stuff. He kept going back to this, the natural man. And, and here God's saying, no, 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 Israel, I know what you were, but I see you as Israel. Israel, governed by God. That's how I see you. I don't see you like you think of yourself. I don't see you as that person that continues to struggle no, I don't see you like that. I see you as new in Christ. I see you as in Christ. I see you as victorious and overcomer. And that's what um, God speaks to him and speaks over him. And he says, he gives them these, these commands, be fruitful and multiply, which is, a, which is the command given to us, that we are called to bear fruit, of course, and we're called to multiply, to spread this good news that we share, this, this hope that we have. But he says, a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you and your descendants. Of course, the promise that had been given to Abraham had been passed on to Isaac. And then now it's being reestablished and given to Jacob. He had been given it earlier, a couple of chapters earlier, but now God is saying, Jacob, Jacob, I know you've messed up. And I know you think that you've lost the promises of God. I know that you think that you've messed up so badly that you've forfeited your inheritance. And God's saying, no, 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 not at all. I still love you. I still care about you. And I'm still gonna take you with me. I still want to do the work, the work that I have for you. I want to do it through you. And sometimes we feel like, ah, how could God accept me again after all how, how much I've messed up? <laughs> Look at Jacob. Jacob continues to make mistakes, continues to fall on his face, continues to do the wrong thing. And God continues to say, I still love you and I still am caring for you. And that's a great promise. It's a great hope for us because God's going to do the same thing for us. He's going to continue to carry us even if we mess up, even if we make mistakes. So then it says here, from you, company of nations shall proceed from you. Kings shall come from you, shall come from your body. This is the result of a godly legacy. Now, Jacob didn't have it all right. We've looked at that. But he had enough things right that he was passing on a godly legacy to his kids, which would then be passed on forward. And God made sure of it. We see the same thing is true in history. I want to tell you the story about uh, two men that lived in the 1700s. One was Jonathan Edwards, born in 1703 um, in East Windsor, Connecticut. This is a guy that uh, learned to love the Lord at an early age. At age 13, he goes off to attend Yale. Okay? Now, granted, it wasn't like we have tons of universities and there's tons of people applying to get into Yale. Okay? But he was exceptional for his day. There weren't that many universities in 1716 when he went to school. Um, he eventually became president of what would eventually be called uh, Princeton. It was called um, College of New Jersey at the time. But becomes, he eventually becomes the president of Princeton University. He becomes a great pastor. He loves his kids. Um, he woke up at 4.30 every morning to read and to write in his library. Extensive travels. Um, but he always made time for his 11 children and uh, at least spending an hour every day with just his kids. 
um, there, there was a scholar, Benjamin Warfield, that studied Princeton's, Prince, or studied Edward's legacy. Edwards had thir- has 1,394 known descendants. This is as of the early 1900s. Uh, almost 1,400 descendants from him in about 200 years. Okay, so that's a lot of people. That's very prolific. All right. Um, of his known descendants, there were 13 college presidents, 65 college professors, 30 judges, 100 lawyers. That's not a good legacy there. Um, 60 physicians. 70 army and navy officers, 100 pastors, and 60 authors of prominence, 100 missionaries, three United States senators, and 80 public servants in other capacities, including governors and ministers of foreign countries. Oh, and one person that became vice president of the United States. All from one guy, all within 200 years. That's, that's a pretty good legacy. Now, let's compare that to a guy named... Now, and Jonathan Edwards was a man that loved the Lord and spent time in his word and was a pastor, a shepherd, incredible man of God. Next, compare that to a guy named Max Juke, who was a, an atheist, contemporary of, of uh, Jonathan Edwards. Um, as an adult, Jukes had a drinking problem that kept him from holding a steady job. Also kept him from showing much concern for his wife and children. He'd disappear for days um, and return drunk. Um, he basically kind of squandered his life. Um, they were able to, tra- to trace, through Jukes, about 540 descendants, less than half of, of Edwards. They were stunned when they looked at the, the, the legacy that Jukes left his family. Jukes' known descendants, of those 540, 310 died as paupers. 150 were criminals, including seven murderers, more than 100 were drunkards, and half of the female descendants were prostitutes. Look at this next screen. Compare the two. Jonathan Edwards, same time, same potential, same possibilities. But what kind of a legacy is being passed? The one, Jonathan Edwards, is serving others, is loving the Lord, and is trying to walk and follow the Lord. At age, it was, I don't know, 19, he made these resolutions to always try to examine himself and, and be better the next day, to try to always see, is he walking with the Lord? I mean, his resolutions are just, I mean, they're, they're just momentous. It's like huge that he tried to follow and impress and push himself every day to be better than the, next, than the last day. And you see this legacy on the left side. That's the result of Jonathan Edwards in 200 years, almost 1,400 descendants versus Max Duke in the same 200 years and having less than 500 traceable descendants. He could have had more, but they couldn't trace them. They couldn't track them. Criminals, prostitutes, murderers. What's the difference? Just two guys. But what are we passing on? What are we passing on to our kids? What are we showing them? What are we teaching them? Are we living out that legacy? There's, it's often said that you can affect five generations. You, it's you, and you affect your kids and then hopefully you're living long enough to affect your grandkids. And because you're affecting your grandkids, you can affect your grandkids' kids. And sometimes you even see your grandkids' kids' kids in that extreme example. Looking forward, trying to have that influence, trying to have that impact, trying to, 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 to mentor and disciple. So often we parent out of convenience. If they're yelling and screaming, okay, I need to deal with it. Other than that, they're fine. I'm going to deal with what I want to do. Click. Or am I thinking, how can I stretch my kids? I was, I was with a, over the break, we were with a, a, some dear friends of ours, and um, we were talking about parenting, because they've got um, preteens and teenagers, and we've been through that, and now we've got the younger ones. And, um, and I said, you know what, you can be in different places right now, but the goal is you have to have a plan so that by the time they leave your house, they're able to make choices on their own because you're not going to be able to make those choices for them once they leave. And some parents think that they still can, and some people, parents think that, well, by the time they're six, they should be able to make choices for themselves. They don't know. They don't know how to do that. You've got to be discipling them. You've got to be mentoring them. And Jacob, sometimes he did it. Here, at the beginning of chapter five, 35, he does it. But other places, he doesn't. Well, so now that he's, he's been to Bethel, he's seen, and he's been told by the Lord to go and to dwell there. 
So Bethel, or Jacob, this great man of faith, what does he do in, in uh, chapter 35, verse 16? Then they journeyed from Bethel. Whoa, 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 whoa. God just told him in the first verse of this chapter to go dwell in Bethel. He goes, he hears the Lord, he sees the Lord. He's like, yes, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. All right, good, let's go. There's no indication that he lived there at all. But God had told him to live there. And so many Christians, they, they get right with the Lord. Their life is like, okay, now my life is right, and I, I, I sense the Lord's blessings. I've heard from the Lord. But I don't, do I need to live there right now? Not right now. Do I need to dwell there right now? No, I don't need to dwell there right now. Do I need to be part of that fellowship right now? I'm just going to kind of keep my distance and kind of check in like twice a year, Christmas and Easter. So a lot of people do. But that's not what God said. God said dwell in Bethel. Well, let's watch what happens as a result. Chapter 35, verse 16. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Ani, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. All right, this chapter's had a lot of death so far. Death of the idols, death of Deborah, and here the death of Rachel. They're headed to Ephrath, which is basically outside Bethlehem, and she's pregnant. She's pregnant. She's obviously great with child. Jacob, God told you to go live and dwell, dwell in Bethel. What, what's, what are you thinking? He's thinking, ah, oh, the grass is greener over here. Come on, honey, I know you're not comfortable, and I know that baby's going to come soon, but we'll get there and we'll be fine. No. He leaves Bethlehem, and as a result, I mean, he leaves Bethel, and as a result of leaving Bethel, that may be part of the reason that Rachel died. She wasn't ready for, that, to, for the journey to, Beth, to Bethlehem. Now, she names the son Ben-Ani, which means the son of my pain or son of my sorrows, my suffering, and... Um, Remember that she's the one back in Genesis 30 that said, give me children else I die. Well, she was blessed with a son named Joseph and Joseph really means add more. So she wants more. She's never satisfied. And so God gives her another son, but it really is the death of her. Jacob says, we're not gonna name him son of my, my pain. That's too much of a reminder of Rachel's death. Remember Rachel being his, his, his true love that he loved the most. But he names, instead, names him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Now, where is this little Benjamin boy born? Outside Bethlehem. Benjamin's actually a little bit of a type of Christ, a representation of Christ. He's the son of sorrow, a man of suffering. But then he's also the son of the right hand, the right hand of God. And where is he born? Outside Bethlehem. And when is he born? When the mother's in route to the place. So the pictures here, the illustrations, the, the illusion is that this is a, both Benjamin and um, Joseph are types of Christ. But we see this uh, really clearly right here in this chapter, especially about Benjamin. So verse 21, then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Okay, Bilhah, remember, is, was one of Jacob's wives. Um, it was actually Rachel's maidservant, and Rachel's died. His el now, Jacob's eldest son, Reuben, goes and lays with, has sex with his concubine. What's Jacob do? He heard about it. Once again, the passive parenting. He hmm, doesn't know what to do. Does, there's no record of him ever saying anything until the end of his life. Jacob holds a grudge, but he doesn't deal with it. When there's sin in the camp, we need to deal with it immediately. When, when your kids are walking from, away from the Lord, we need to deal with it immediately, especially when they're doing something like that that would, offend, that would be um, an offense to the whole family. Uh, actually, to hold your place there in Genesis 35 and, and skip to chapter 49. This is Jacob. At the end of his life, he's given a blessing to each of his 12 sons. 
And here we go in um, chapter 49, verse 2. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Here he is. He's going to bless them. He starts with Reuben, the firstborn. He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. This is a pretty good blessing. He's a really nice blessing. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Whew. Holding a grudge. Here's his last parting words to his son. And what's he say? You should have been the greatest. You should have been, you, you had the potential. Instead, you're unstable as water. You, you blew it. And then he goes to his next son. Ouch. Think of what's going through Reuben's mind. Now, Reuben, of course, had buried, buried that guilt all of his life. But wow, as a father, ouch. That didn't help Reuben. Reuben happened to be the one, um, when we come to Joseph, that actually st- sticking up for Joseph and trying to take care of Joseph. Um, Reuben actually tries to do some good things. But Jacob, because of, once again, his own name being defiled, his own character, his own reputation, he can't see that. Do you have a problem with your kids in that way? You can't see past their sin because it's, you think it's a reflection upon you? If that's your challenge, I want you to think about that. Are you going to be able to parent effectively? Because you're not parenting at this point. You're concerned about yourself. You're not concerned about your kid and what your kid's going through and what he needs to be, needs to happen for him to be restored or for him to be healed or for him to, I mean, yeah, he needs to repent, certainly. But are you going to hold this grudge against him? Well, let's finish up the chapter back in Genesis 35, verse 22. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah, verse 23, were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padam Aram. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his son Esau and Jacob buried him. Okay. There, that's chapter ends. Another death. Death of the idols, the death of Deborah, the death of Rachel, the death of his dad, Isaac. Isaac's 180, and of course in this day they were were living a little bit longer. But remember, when when he went for the blessing... Some 20 plus years earlier, he thought that his dad wasn't going to make it. God allowed him to see his father again. Um, One more time here, or at least another time, and some 20 years later. And so a reminder, sometimes when people think, ah, they're done. Well, God knows the number of your days, and you may have another 20 years left in you. And a person, the the doctors may say, no, they're not going to make it. That doesn't, (laughs) the doctors don't. They can pronounce a death sentence, but God's the only one that makes a decree. So, with that death, um, it brought Esau together, and we'll look at that next week. Pastor Dave will be going into chapter 36 and uh, the genealogy of Esau and how Jacob and Esau, we, they get reconciled, we talked about, but here is the, uh, the parenting aspect, is the thing I want to leave you with, and the idol aspect. Getting right with the Lord. How do you know if you have an idol? Where's your, ta- your time, your treasure? What are you talking about? Is, and in taking that before the Lord and asking him, Lord, is there something here that I'm holding on to that's not of you? Am I, is there something here that has a greater place in my life than you do? And then for those of you that are parents or grandparents, taking it before the Lord, are you passive parenting? Or are you parenting with power and purpose? and trying to lay out a course for your kids? Are you recognizing when they stumble and fall that don't stand there and wait for them to get picked up? You, you, you run and you pick them up. You love them. Be like a Jacob in his strength. Don't be like a Jacob in his frailty and his weakness. Focus on himself. Let's pray. Lord God,
thank you so much for this, your, your incredible word. And that you show us these pictures of people in their glory and their beauty, but also in their depravity and their weakness. Because it gives us hope. Because we make mistakes and we, we screw up all the time. And so, Lord, we confess that we are dependent on you. None of us can do this life alone. None of us can be a parent or grandparent or spouse or son or daughter and do it perfectly without you. We need you, Father, for every step. Lord, may you be searching our hearts right now. May you look inside us and see if there be any wicked way. See if there be any idols that we're holding on to. Anything that is really taking your place. For God, we don't want to be, we don't want to do that. We don't want anything to take your place, Lord. Lord, may you open our eyes to our blindness because we can't see. So place people in our paths to show us your truth. And Lord, may we come humbly before your word and hear. Taking off the earrings and hear your voice more than any other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.